Welcome to Lunch of the Lord. I'm Pastor Mark, and we're in Ezra chapter 9. We're going to be starting verse 3 this lesson, but before we begin, Jeremiah 15, 16, thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Now, Ezra here, with the people that return with him from Babylon, they come to Jerusalem, they hand over the the uh, offerings uh, from the uh, king and his and his counselors and the people in <clears throat> Babylon, the Jews that stayed behind. And now they settle in for a little bit. And shortly after they settle in, uh, some people approach uh, Ezra and they tell him about the sins of the people that have been taking place in Jerusalem. And it says here in the last part of verse 2, uh, the hand of the princes and the rulers hath been chief, chief in this trespass. So it was the, the, the rulers of the children of Israel in Jerusalem. They have, they have uh, been leading the people into straying away from God by marrying uh, Gentiles from the surrounding nations. And now in verse 3, we're going to see Ezra's reaction. And it says here, And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard, and I sat down astonished. Now, Ezra here will react uh, will react to what he has just heard, but he is not going to react in a way in which we, in which we will re-react. Uh, Ezra here uh, plucks off his hair from his head, plucks off his beard. He sits down and he's totally astonished at what he hears concerning the the people in uh, is in Jerusalem that have returned. And now uh, he has, he's greatly, uh, it's a tremendous grief to his heart. The ripping of both the outer and the inner garments was a sign of great grief and sorrow. And it was also a sign of God's displeasure. The pulling out of his hair was even a further sign of Ezra's uh, grief. Then he sat down astonished that the people who had been delivered from the Babylonian captivity just 75 years ago would so quickly return to the very sins that caused their captivity. Oh, the sinfulness and the wickedness of the human heart. It's so true that that even we today we can we can God can as Christians God can deliver us from from sins that we commit and and God can give the victory well the victory is his but God gives the victory and we can be delivered from from nagging sins and 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 things in our life and then several years down the road, we begin to slip right back into those same sins. The, our sinful nature, our, our sinful flesh, it, it, it all, it's always craving our weaknesses. And we can, we, if we're not on the watch, if we're not on our guard, uh, praying and seeking God and staying humbly before Him, those old sins will return. Those old sins, the temptations and the desire to commit these old sins, they'll return and they'll come back with force. Not, not stronger than God himself, but again, if we're not on our guard, these old sins can come back in our life and we can slip right back into them again. And the very sins that caused us to leave God and, and in a sense have God chasing us, well, they'll do it again. Those old sins, we let them come back in our life. They'll, they'll come back in and we'll start committing those old sins again and God will have to chasten us. 
Ezra was grief stricken because the law of God, the very law that he came to teach them, was being violated. The children of Israel did not stay separated from the things and people and the lusts of this world. We have to, our our life with God has to be daily. It has to be moment by moment. We have to have a separated heart unto God and unto the things of God. Because if we don't, if we don't approach it, uh, approach our life with God as being separated from this world, the world will creep in. The things of this world, the lusts and of our flesh, the lusts of this, the pleasures of this world will creep in and begin to take over in our life. Now verse 4, and it says, Then were assembled unto me everyone that trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the transgression of those that had been carried away. And I sat astonished again until, until the evening sacrifice. Now it says here in the first part of verse 4, then were assembled unto me everyone that trembled at the words at the words of the God of Israel. And this is an important part of this whole uh, this whole uh, uh, time when Ezra comes back. Uh, this this portion here, you know, there is something greatly lacking in Christianity today, and that is that many Christians do not tremble at the word of God. They don't tremble at God's word. Oh, they are good people, and they go to church regularly, but their walk with God is not all that it should be. They are still attached to things of this world, and their hearts are somewhat divided between God and their interests in the world. There is no trembling at the words of the Holy God. When they think of the Bible, familiarity prevents them from seeing the holiness and the purity and the power of these words. Listen, when we, when we uh, have our devotionals and we open the word of God, do we, in our hearts, do, are we thankful or do we somewhat tremble in our hearts that we're holding God's word in our hands? The, the, the word of God is being held in our hands. We are about ready to read God's holy word. A Christian will never gain spiritual maturity when the Bible is not held in the heart as the highest degree of sacredness. And that's true. That's true. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you will never, a, Christ, a Christian will never reach spiritual maturity when they're familiar with the Word of God. The Word of God has to be sacred in our hearts. There needs to be a, a, a holy, in a sense, trembling in our hearts when we take God's word. You don't realize it, but there's, there's millions and millions of people today that, that, that are not allowed to have the Bible at all in their house or in their possession at, at, at anywhere. It's just not allowed. There's countries that are outlawed completely. And, and you have to, has, the Bible has to be smuggled in. And, and here in America and in many other countries, we have access to the Bible. And because of that, it, it breeds familiarity if we're not careful. And when familiarity comes in, I'm telling you, there, you cannot reach true spiritual maturity when there's a familiarity with the Word of God. We need to see this is God's Word. This is, this is a, a holy book written by a holy God. When reading the word of God, it is God speaking directly to his children. 
there should be a great reverence when we open the Bible to read it. The voice that speaks to our hearts is the same voice that spoke from the cloud at Sinai. It is the same voice that spoke at Jesus' baptism. And it's the same voice that spoke in Gethsemane and also on the cross of Calvary. The same voice that spoke when at Jesus' baptism, the same voice that spoke on in the cloud at Mount Sinai, the same voice that spoke at these times is the same voice that's speaking to you when you read the Word of God. It is a great privilege to be able to open and to read this book because there are many who are not allowed to. We are granted by God to hold in our hands the very mind and the will of God. Do you understand that? That, that, that when you open the word of God, you have access to the mind and to the will and to the heart of God. When we stand before the Lord, what account will we give of how we handled the word of God? What account will we give? How precious is this word to our hearts? The Bible is a book that when we read it, it probes our heart. As we read and study this book, it searches the depths of our heart. Right? Psalm, Psalm 139, 23, and 24, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You know, one, one way that God searches and probes your heart is through his word, through his word. It can also be in prayer, and it can also be through other believers, God ministering to you through other believers. But the main, I believe the main way in which God searches and probes our heart is by the reading of his word. If you do not tremble, in your heart, when you open God's word, you should go to God and confess your familiarity. Plead with God to give you a trembling heart for his word. Oh, I don't mean you have to actually physically shake like the Quakers did, but in our hearts, when we, when we get ready to, to open the word of God, there should be a holy reverence in our heart for this word, the preciousness of his word. And we won't, we won't really find out how precious this word is until we stand before God, until we go to heaven. And we, then we'll understand the full preciousness of this word. And it says here, uh, again, in the first part of verse 4, then were assembled unto me everyone that trembled at the words of the God of Israel. You know, another lesson that we can get from, from that little portion of scripture is that we should seek to have friends that also tremble at God's word. Ezra said, then were assembled unto me those that trembled at his word. Not only was Ezra trembling in his heart, uh, because of the word of God, but people that also trembled at his word came to him. Iron sharpens iron. God will greatly bless you if you choose to have friends who tremble at God's word. As Christians who tremble at the word of God, we should stand in support of those who stand against the sins of this world. It was a great support for Ezra to have these people stand with him as he goes against this, this sin of intermarriage with the Gentiles, right? 
they strengthened Ezra's hand. When a pastor or some leader starts standing and starts standing against sin and standing up for the word of God, Christians need to surround them and support them in their means of 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 standing upon the word of God and supporting God's word in this sinful world. And this is what happened with Ezra. Now Ezra comes back, he sees he he finds out the sins of what's going on in in Jerusalem and it grieves his heart. And now people start people see how it affected how these sins affected uh, Ezra and there were people that had the same feeling in their heart they trembled at the word of God and they began to come around to Ezra and they began to support him why because this from right now on Ezra is going to be have to make some hard fast decisions concerning the word of God and concerning these people here in Jerusalem Remember, he came back here to reform and to rebuild the people. To rebuild the people. Remember, the first, the first six chapters of Ezra was the rebuilding of the temple. The last four chapters uh, of, Ez, of Ezra are the rebuilding of the people in their hearts. To restore the word of God back to the, their hearts. And then it says here, the last part of verse 4, and I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. So Ezra, we don't know what time he, <laughs> what time he heard this news, um, but uh, he he sat there completely astonished and grief stricken until the evening sacrifice. And it's believed that the evening sacrifice was at approximately three o'clock in the afternoon. And it was at this sacrifice when the people in the surrounding area would gather together for this sacrifice. So every day at about three o'clock in the afternoon, the, the children of Israel would come and they would come to, to the temple and they would offer sacrifice unto God. And Ezra was there at this temple, grief stricken. So it was a great, uh, I don't want to say, I don't want to say it was a coincidence. It was God's will that when Ezra heard, he just, he went to the, he sat there in Jerusalem astonished until the evening sacrifice. And it was good that he did because now at the evening sacrifice, people are going to be coming to this sacrifice. And when they come to the sacrifice uh, uh, at the temple, they're going to see Ezra and they're going to see well, what is he doing? Why is he doing this? And then it's going to be coming out. It's going to, it's going to start spreading in the people in Jerusalem of, of that. This is a serious thing. This is a serious thing. What we, what the sins they've been committing and what they've done. And, and they're going to see the seriousness of this in Ezra's reaction and his pulling out of his hair and of his head and of his beard and ripping his clothes and people. People, people don't know this already, but as they come to Jerusalem, they're going to start finding out. And word is going to get out in Jerusalem that we have a problem, right? It's like like the old, like the movie, we have a problem, Houston, right? <laughs> well, we have a problem, Jerusalem. And, uh, and God is, it's time now to fix this problem and to get right with God again, all right? We're going to continue on in verse 5 next lesson. But until then, walk with the Lord. I know he walks with you.